Shell Museum. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we're supposed to be recording this. Okay. Um, and the editor of the Nautilus, a scientific journal about mollusks. Dr. Leal received his PhD in biology and fisheries from the University of Miami. He was the assistant editor of Sea Frontiers magazine and worked as a at the Natural History Museum in Paris and at the Smithsonian. In 2023, Dr. Liao was awarded the prestigious Neptune Award from Conchologists of America for his services to the global community of shell enthusiasts. And most importantly, he is a TV personality <laughs> who was recently featured on PBS on the show Changing Seas, and the episode is entitled Mollusks More Than a Shell. If you haven't seen it, you must see it. I've watched it twice. I'm probably going to watch it more times because every time I watch it, I learn something new. So um, we're grateful, Jose, to have you here with us. Welcome. And he's got a great presentation for you. Well, thank you so much, David. That, that was a nice introduction. A um, couple of things I want to say is that uh, in addition to that, all that you said, I also have I'm a very, very that's called old or long, long, long lived connection to the shell club. I mean, the uh, first time I heard about the shell club was when I received and applied for one of your um, research grants back in 1987. So that's 36 years ago. And since then, you know, it's been, it's been great uh, working at the shell club. Uh, prior to our um, renovation, we used to, Prior to you having meetings um, at MTA or, or different different venues, we used to host the, the chocolate meetings at the museum on Sunday afternoons. I don't know if some of you here may remember that. But anyway, it's great to be here. And I hope that uh, my my program, my talk doesn't uh, that doesn't betray the title that I chose for it. They shouldn't be boring by vaults. They, the boring by vaults should not, should not be boring. So let's see what I have for you. One of, uh, one of the things I did when I, I tried to, um, when I started researching this topic, was that I found that there are many, many different groups of bivalves that do bore into hard substrates, the rock, coral rock, coral colonies, large shells, and so on. The picture I chose to open my program is actually a local, uh, actually not local, but from the east coast of Florida, a panicus color that was found by some of my colleagues uh, from the Florida uh, Wildlife Conservation uh, Commission. They, they were doing like a, a, you know, just a survey on the beaches there and found this massive die-off of calicus calories, similar to what we have here once in the blue moon. And, uh, and Steve Geiger, uh, who some of you know from, uh, from FWC in, in St. Pete, looked at them carefully and found uh, those little, little boring, little colored balls there. They're actually little boring folds, And we'll talk about that at the very end of the talk. I just wanna you know, give you an alert of, this is one of the things I've been working, doing some research on. So let me make a, a distinction right away. So right off the bat, we know um, that there are two, uh, you know, the bivalves that live inside things. We have burrowing bivalves. And burrowing bivalves, they usually are found in sand or mud. Most of the bivalves you find on, find on the beaches here are burrowing bivalves. So they, they burrow into soft substrate, sand, mud, or sandy, sandy mud. And there's a big difference, you know, the burrowing bivalves, when they, as they go in, into the substrate, into the bottom, uh, what the, the, the bottom that's above them may collapse on top of them. So they keep going and the sand keeps falling on them. And that's a big difference from the boring bivalves where they dig, they dig this hole, this bar hole, and the bar hole stays there. You know, it doesn't change shape. Once they bar, bar into rock, the, the hole stays there. 
So even after the bivalve dies, and I have two examples there. I have the uh, the Mahoma, which is one of the local, I mean, this is a different species, but one is represented here on Sunnyvale by, uh, one, um, used to be called Mahoma constricta. And, and on the bottom, and, and that's, a, uh, the one on top is an example of a bivalve that burrows in soft substrates, a burrower. On the bottom, wiring bivalve. And one of my favorite wiring bivalves is the mahogany date mussel. And, and I don't know if you can see there, and, a little that's a jewel box you know the big the big structure is a jewel box and on the bottom of the jewel box there is a mahogany big muscle that likes to bar into shells and corals if you have any questions just ask don't be shy it's better to ask the question when the subject is there on the screen than wait until the end when you know things change our minds change quickly uh, Good examples of burrowing bivalves, and, the, and that's the last you're gonna hear about burrowing bivalves today in this talk. We just wanna show you, uh, you know, a few examples on the right, we have a pen shell, and the pen shell is kind of half buried under the, the, only like the top quarter or third of the shell is exposed out of the sand. Um, we, do have, we do have like a jackknife uh, type clam, and you can see the big foot That's, that plays a major role in, 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 in the burrowing of that species, of those, uh, those uh, jackknife, jackknife clay. Um, I think this here would be a, uh, a lucene type bivalve. And on the extreme uh, left, the surf clay. And you notice also that they all have a different depth in the sand. So it's almost like you have in places where you have a lot of bivalves. It's almost like we have an apartment beauty where some are deeper in the first floor and then the second floor, third floor. So they, they kind of parse out the space that way. So there's no competition for space because they are all uh, living at different levels, burrowing in the sand. So much for burrowing. Uh, I have this statement here by a famous uh, malacologist from Harvard, um, Dr. Ruth Turner. And, and Ruth said, uh, undoubtedly, the two borders evolved from burrowers by forms that were living in increasingly harder substrata, I mean, increasingly harder types of bottom. Wow. And that's from an evolutionary standpoint over millions and millions of years. So she was assuming that the barring bivalves evolved from sim simple burrowing bivalves. So we're going to look at seven families. Uh, we're going to look at some most of local representatives of seven families of barring bivalves. Break the mussels, Mitili did. And if we all know what mussels are, a good example of a barring mussel is the mahogany date mussel. Second, the uh, giant clams. And uh, strange as it may seem, giant clams, you know, the big ones that are that uh, we actually have a couple of on display at the museum. We have some live smaller ones in our uh, living gallery. We'll have them again soon. Uh, they are members of the family Cardi, the same family as the cockles. So giant clams are nothing but glorified cockles. Uh, the Venerity, which are the family of Venus clams, the Venerity is probably uh, the most uh, species, the, the family that has four species. Bivalves, the marine bivalve, and uh, and the venere they represented. They have they have a couple of uh, different genera that bar into into rock. Uh, one of them, and I'll show it to you later, is the false angeline. And the fell false angeline looks so much like the beautiful angeline, but it has no relation other than being a bivalve to. They're very separated in the you know taxonomy. Uh, then we have the chimney clams. Very interesting. Uh, I did spend some time studying uh, one of the local, local species of chimney clam. We have the deep sea bivalve, similar to shipworms in the family Xylophagate. And oh, you'll see some of them too. Uh, the shipworms family Teridini did, the Terido uh, genus and relatives. And last but not least, 
to what is to me the best family of Mario Mario is the fall ads. And that includes the angel wings and, 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 the, and the ox and all kinds of good stuff. Any questions? So five falls bar by using uh, two different uh, procedures, two different methods. Uh, one is chemical. They may produce uh, weak acids that will dissolve the rock they're barring in. So um, some mussels do that, some giant clam, the giant clams do that, uh, one, all species on it. Too many clams do that. And you can tell sometimes because the shells of those bar in my house are super thin and very thin, and there is there is no there are no structures, there are no teeth or uh, you know spikes or anything. So you can you look at them and say, "Ha, this must be a chemical bar because they have no mechanical uh, structures that help you know bar into hard hard rock." And the second method will be mechanical. Uh, which happens by the physical grinding wood or rock by the animal using the shell. And usually they use the shell, the shell will have cheese or structures like cheese, cheese graters, and then they use their muscles to rock back and forth so they can bar into that shell or rock. Um, the truth is that most likely most species we're talking about use um, some form of chemical, in, even the mechanical bars, the ones that look like, oh, they only use the shell bar. Now more and more we're finding that they may also use chemical substances associated with the mechanical bar. So let's look at those families and some examples, and I'll try to stick to the local species. Some of them will want to be local because they don't have them here. But whenever there are local uh, representatives, so that if you have them in your collection or if you find them, you know we you know what they are. Uh, in the family of mussels, the first one I want to show you is not a local species. I'm just betraying myself here. I mean, I was not telling you the truth. This is not local. Um, this is an European uh, date mussel. Uh, and the European date mussel is very used to be very common and uh, because they were used as food, they just went the way of the dodo almost. It is still still present, but in very, very reduced populations, you know, almost extinct. Um, there is a picture there of this temple um, in, in a place called Pozzuoli in, in Italy, where there are marble columns and the marble columns uh, sit on top of a, a lake. And very high above the lake, there are some holes on the marble columns. And those holes are made by that species of date mussel when uh, the water was higher. And the water has moved up and down over you know, the centuries because of the local geology. Uh, it has, it's, you know, the, the land sank, sunk, and then the water went away and so on. So there were lots of upheavals there. Uh, and what happened was that people who look at those holes, and, and some of them actually had residues of the shells of this big mussel. And that's what they can do. They bar into, uh, into hard rock, hard mar marble, which is a form of, uh, I think it's magnesium carbonate. And uh, anyway, I started with this species, then I'll move to uh, show you the shell there. Now you notice the shell doesn't have any gnarly aspect to it, you know, which tells tells you right away that they used mostly chemical bar. So they produce a, a, an enzyme-like type type of uh, substance, a weak acid that helps dissolve the marble. Um, this is the local species of date mussel, which is a, um, it can bar into shells, it can bar into <clears throat> coral colonies, and it can Unusually, uh, very unusual that uh, a species can bar into living coral, and I'll show you why. So this is a shell found here of Sunnyvale. It looks really beat up and old, but I decided to show it anyway, because it's part of our collection. And it was collected by Dale, Dale Stingley, who was a very well-known way back when, local collector. And, uh, and this, this uh, particular shell seen in different views here was collected in 1949. 
So I hope you can see this diagram. And the diagram is a, like a time series beginning from the left. And on the, I, mean, I hope you can see from the back. The, uh, the, the little detail on, on, on the left, number one, shows the coral, a coral quality, a living coral quality, the surface in cross section. And right there is the larva of a date muscle, the mahogany date muscle. The larva comes and settles onto the surface. Well, the coral is growing. Coral quality will grow outward. Imagine like a big balloon that gets inflated. That's the kind of a, like a brain coral structure and it keeps expanding with time. The, uh, the bivalve, the boring bivalve, will keep boring and, and it will keep boring in. So there are two things happening there. One is the coral, coral colony is growing outward and the, the boring bivalve is boring and growing in. Uh, it keeps growing. There's a little bar hole. They have to have all, always the same distance from the surface of the coral colony so they can they can feed, they can suck water in for future feeding and breathe. And they, they keep growing. And finally, they get to their final size because those those take muscles like any shell will not grow beyond the given size. They get to a point that stop. Uh, so it gets to the what I call the final muscle size. And when they get to that point, they still have to keep following or, or matching the growth of the coral colony. So in order to do that, they begin making what I call false floors to the hole. So those little lines here are little, are little false floors. They keep building that so they can keep you know, going up and hex to have some some base of support. Um, and at some point, the uh, the bivalve dies. Just say excuse yeah. me, but yeah, the, they can't hear you on Zoom if you're not the mic. But you yeah, take sure. no problem. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yes, so it, 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 I hope you. I mean, I hope, hope this is easy to understand. I tried to do this diagram so I can see how how the how the bivalve can manage growth of the coral colony. Uh, the coral doesn't stop growing. Um, okay. And finally it closes, uh, the, the, you know, the, the hole closes when, when uh, the, the bivalve dies, coral colony keeps growing. I have a picture here of that, uh, what is that? I have a picture of a coral colony, and you can see the little holes. There are two little dark uh, structures. There are little holes. That's what, that's the hole that uh, the bivalve uses to, you know, the side comes out to suck water in for breathing and feeding. And that's the structure in cross section, and you can see the little false floors here. This is a very old picture. Back, back, it takes back from the savages, actually. I, I was doing some work on that. Um, another species, a Caribbean species, you can also find it in, uh, in, the, in the east coast of Florida, the Keys, called the Antillian eight muscle, and they pour into uh, soft limestone. And bryozoan colonies, bryozoans are like colonial little animals that make these beautiful structures. Another body mus muscle, a coral body muscle, uh, called uh, the technical name is Gregariella coraliophaga. And when pe people first found it, they thought that that, that, uh, that bivalve eats the coral. Coralio meaning, meaning coral, phaga meaning the one who eats coral. But it doesn't eat, it just pours into it. And that's also a local species from Senegal. One thing I, I strongly encourage when I find little, when I find little pieces of corals or even shells that have a lot of holes, pick them up and take them home and look at them. Because you may find those things inside and it's very cool. Uh, and that's a picture of the shell also from Senegal. Uh, <clears throat> the giant clams in the family, family Cardiidae, the family of cockles. The uh, giant clams, they were thought of 
uh, and, and as being only mechanical orders into coral colonies. But recently, a few years back, they, there, there were a couple of papers published where they found that they actually produce a weak acid so they can kind of sink into the coral colony. They kind of become part of the whole structure of the coral reef. That's Dachna uh, Drosea. We actually had that species in the living gallery in the museum before, before the hurricane, you know, did what it did. And we will have it again soon. Uh, that's the shell. It grows to be about four or five inches. It's not a large species. And this is a diagram that shows how they, they put some uh, sensitive um, foil, like a kind of paper hole. They could detect the production of weak acids by the shell in that region of the shell. I mean, the shell divide. So they can sink into the coral. Well, the Venus clams, the, 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 a couple of those species, actually, those species that I'll show today, for many years, they were considered to be a separate family, a family known as Petriconidae. The subfamily. They, you know, the specialists decided that it doesn't exist. They are actually Venus clams. They have all the you know, body parts and the genetics of, uh, of Venus clams. They're, they're, you know, close relatives to our Ohawk, um, Crossbar Venus, you know, the Sun, Sunray Venus and all that. So this one actually kind of looks like a Venus clam, but not much. So this is called the Atlantic Tricolidae. And it actually they can bar into, into limestone and coral colonies too. I have this picture here that I took many years ago. I mean, you know, we don't even want to know how long ago that was. But um, it shows a, a very strange situation, very typical. This is a tricolidae that I'm talking about. That, you know, this barring Venus clamp on a piece of old coral rock. And right here, you have a mahogany date mussel that was also barring into the coral crawl in the coral rock. But it, it didn't bar into the coral rock. When it, when it found, when it bumped into the petricolite, it started barring into the petricolite too. And you can see the, the damage already here. So you know it's it's uh, even in even in a the the hated quote unquote structure like that there's a lot of bad that happening. Uh, you know nature doesn't stop. So another uh, another well known locally well known I, I think, uh, Orin Ivolf is the false angelweed, which is also a Venus clam, and uh, it looks nothing like a Venus clam, but it is one, and it probably bars into hard clay, chalk, solid mud, peat moss, and limestone. So it's a generalist. It just bars into whatever put in front of them. Uh, not wood, but you know, all those types of softer rocks. Um, the next picture just shows you a, um, you know, a true anchovy on the, on the right-hand side and a false anchovy on the left. And there's just so some of the similarities. Um, if, you know, if you find one, and if you, if you don't know, well, is this a real angel wing or a false angel wing? Look, well, the false angel wing is a much smaller species. You know, usually it doesn't grow beyond uh, a couple of inches at most. And you know how large the true angel wings can be. They also have a hinge with teeth, like little, like little teeth. And little solids. This one doesn't. And it does have all these little, little pieces and those that hold the muscles together. Uh, the, uh, the true angel wing sits in, in between a bar, bar, burrowing bivalve and a boring bivalve because it bars into hard mud. And that's what you see here in the back of, um, you know, I don't know if they are still there, but they used to be in the back of Blind Pass. You know, the, the Wolfer Keys, the little islands behind Jane Dolly, they, they, they used to be there. Um, the chimney clams, one of my favorite, too. I mean, I'm really, 
I mean, I, it's, it's like having many children and don't know which one is a favorite. Um, I kind of like all of them, but this one also had a special place in my heart for this this particular family, the Gustav Kennedy. And, um, and, and one of the reasons is that we working with a colleague, a doctor, uh, James Kennedy, who used to be a volunteer at the museum. Jim actually found, um, he, he not only found this local, this species locally for the first time, but he found that the name of the species, the species was totally forgotten by malacologists for the past uh, almost 100 years. It, 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 you know, it had been named, but nobody was, was hiding the species in their shell guides or shell books or, or not, not like that. So we, we took a special interest in, in that that one species. In Florida, there are four species of this family. And uh, here they are. Um, we have Spanglaria rostrata. I don't think they have common names. Rastrochina ovata, uh, Lamikina hyens, and finally the Stimson's chimney clam, which is the one that, uh, that you can find here most of the time inside inside large shells, very common inside uh, ponderous arcs, uh, pohogs, uh, blue boxes, even in olive, a big olive, dead olive shells, you can find them bar, bar, bar in there. And there it is. It's a very non script shell. You never find those shells isolated. You never find them by themselves on the beach because they're so thin. And, and, uh, and you can find them if you, if you find the you know, a shell that looks like a piece of Swiss cheese, like a cornlocker. And then look because those holes may have been made by one chimney clam. I have here those diagrams, they show uh, the position of the muscles that shut the shell closed. It's called a doctor muscle. So that's the fourth species. I have a few more images so you can see. That's a picture I took under a, a uh, scanning electron mi uh, microscope. And it shows that the shell, you can see the claws. And you can see that the shell itself is permanently open. And this is because the shell is, you know, protected inside the host shell. The shell is very thin, so it is a chemical bar. Here is a, a, a case uh, in the valve of the uh, ponderous arc, piece of a ponderous arc. That was uh, bored by a number of chimney clams. And what you see is the outer surface of the shell has all these holes. And inside, you can see the dwelling that the chimney clam makes. The chimney clams are really cool because they can, they can keep growing inside their host shell. But the moment they become longer than the thickness of the host shell, let's say the host shell is you know, a quarter of an inch deep. You know, if they grow to be, let's say, a little bit more than a quarter, then they begin making this little dwelling. They make the dwelling out of mucus and calcium carbonate. Then it becomes hard like a little igloo. Um, and you'll see next why uh, they're called chimney clams. Uh, this is a, uh, Little sand dollar, sand dollar about, I would say about a couple of inches in diameter that Amy tripped from Marco Island found. And Amy found that and, and brought it to the museum. And, uh, and here there are four chimney clams. One of them lost its chimney. You can see why they call chimney clams. They have those little tubes that protect the siphon. So, uh, and on the other side, they have the little the little dwellings, little igloos. Well, that kind of stuff you can find here. It's not uncommon here in Sanibel. Um, what, what's more curious is that uh, Stimson's chimney clams, this particular species, if, if they settle, the larva settles into a very small piece of shell, they will bar into that small piece of shell. And then all of a sudden, they are like a toddler, toddler chimney clam. You know, they, and they look around and say, well, there's no more shell for me to bar into. I'll make my own dwelling. And, and it ends up looking just like this secondary shell because the, 
this is a dwelling of a chimney clamp, and this is the chimney. And if you can see the two holes, so the one is the, you know, exhaled siphon, the other one, the inhale. One siphon sucks the water in, the other siphon spells the water. And that was also found by Amy uh, in Makai Samel. Well, the shipworms, that's the fun thing. Uh, shipworms are, you know, they, they bore into, uh, in, into wood. And uh, the name says that in the old days when the ships, ships were made by wood, they, they caused a lot of damage, a lot of loss. Uh, because the moment they settle in and begin, you know, barring into the wood, uh, you know, they, they just don't stop. It's very complicated. So uh, here's a diagram and a picture of a piece of wood. This is from the Philippines, a species called uh, Teradora princesi, the princess uh, shipworm, in, known in, in uh, the Philippines as Tamilok. And you can see the damage they do to a piece of wood. So look how many are there in just you know, a narrow piece of wood. Uh, they, they are mainly using a very small shell that's very efficient into digging through wood. So they do movement pretty much like a like an owl you know like a new one. Um, here you can see the shell the terminal shell well the shell is nothing the shell is it's just here the rest is all shellless they, they will build to a of calcium carbonate you know uh, like a hard white tube that lines the the, the borehole uh, they also uh, eat, that's a, uh, a picture of, uh, and this is from, from the Philippines, that's a picture I found online of ceviche of Tamilog. So, you know, my, you know, it's not my, I wouldn't, I, I don't know if I'll try that, I probably, I, I, I eat almost anything in terms of models, but that one, I um, have my question. You know, I try not to be prejudiced, but, that uh, I don't know, that soft texture is too much. <laughs> and here, the, the package that they uh, they are sold in. Uh, and the, I like this picture a lot. It's a, from a Spanish website. This is one of the most common species of shipworms, the Toreto navalis. And you can see the aspect of the, you know, the shell. And you can see that I'm talking about cheese grater. It does, you know, it has all those little, little ridges and the ridges have little teeth on them and as they they move that they rock that into the into the wood you know to be able to open the hole and move in um, so this is again it's a more technical illustration just one of you you don't have to read that uh, in those uh, called pellets and the pellets are at the very end the, the animal, the shells are in front, the pallets at the end, and they help seal the hole. So nothing can get into the hole and cause damage to the ship. Uh, so those are the tipsy uh, xylof xylophagus. Uh, they, 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 for many, many years, they were in the same family of shipworks, but they are different species. Uh, this shows an experiment that uh, a couple of colleagues did, uh, Janet, Janet Boyd from the Field Museum and some collaborators a few years back did the, the kind of work. They would deploy um, pieces of wood in the deep sea in places that they know they can go back to. And months or years later, they, they can go back and see how many individuals and of what species have settled and started barring into the and again, that's the shell of those uh, cyclophagus. Also, same kind of structure. Uh, piece of wood. Oh, this is something else. I saw that someone had left a couple of shells of kufas there. So this is what it is. Uh, it's a, uh, a, it's called a giant shipworm. And giant shipworms in the genus kufas, A-U-P-H-U-S. Uh, they are known to um, to harbor um, bacteria 
it will, it's called chemosynthetic bacteria. Same things you find in near hydrothermal vents in the deep sea. So they kind of have those gardens of bacteria that they use to feed on. So they grow their own food. Uh, they can also feed their feed. And, uh, and compost are known to uh, um, actually, they can live in, are into wood, but can also live in the mud. So there are two different forms of the same species that, you know, they have different behaviors. Uh, this is a picture. Uh, later, I encourage you to take a look there. But I don't know who brought this. Oh, okay, great. And, uh, and this is a, a collection manager at the Florida Museum holding a shell, but now you can hold, you can hold your, I don't know if you'll be okay with that. You can look at the, the you know, who was here. Very interesting, very large shell. And, uh, and the animal is a bifold. You know, it doesn't look like one, but at the end, the shell is a little bivalve shell. And you can see it here, the shell. And those are the two different, uh, one, uh, one, the one on the left is the one that burrows into the mud, and this one here is the one that the bark bars into wood. And I think this is the last family, and the one that has a. Uh, well, we have a lot to see about that because it includes, um, you know, the angel wings, the pit ox, mud pit ox, and the, this family is very diverse. It has a lot of species worldwide. Um, it has a lot of species that bar into driftwood. And again, I also want to encourage you to look for driftwood because when you see a driftwood, again, it looks like a big brown piece of. Swiss cheese, uh, and many, many holes. Look carefully because you may see the, some of the local pit dogs uh, they go from Mexico into it. Um, this is a, uh, it's a species from, um, from California. And, and this shell is in the genus Penitella, and it, it bars into mudstone, very hard rock. In relation to you know more soft, softer calcium carbonate limestone and all that, you see more detail. But those shells, they they are really gnarly. They have a lot of teeth, and so the, the shell the shell itself is a mechanical tool that the moss use to. They we would use that bar into uh, whatever they bar. Uh, so to local species, again the. The angel wing is kind of in between a grower and a bar because it can be it can be taken into a softer substrate. And then you have the uh arnia, you know, the mud binoc is the common name of arnia and two kind of. It can also be found locally. I don't know if it still can be found, but it used to be, yes. I'm sorry. What I'm... size is the mud pit up? The, the barnia? Yes. Yeah. Well, the barnia is, you know, probably about an inch and a half, two inches at most, not as large as the, as the angel wings. And they used to be found on some of the hard, harder mud on the back of uh, my pass. Because they might still be found, but they're pretty uncommon. I'm sorry? They can still be found, but it, it can still be found. Yeah. You know, I when I say that is because you know I want to be as accurate. I don't want to if I if I don't have the record, I don't I'm always but thank you, Ken. I know Ken does a lot of work around many, many different places, so he knows what he's talking about. And then, uh, you know, the one some of you may have seen that. I love to talk about that. I think, I don't know if Kim or I, one of us found that on Woman's Beach. And it's a little piece of wood that had a number of um, giant pit Um So we found that maybe a few years back. And it's like four inches long. It's not a, it's a little, it's like a little piece of a, Maybe black mangrove, some kind of tree, like a branch, 
and, and you see the holes there. And we, when you look carefully, um, there are like, I assume there are probably around 300 bivalves in this little four inch piece of wood. Uh, I call it a stridentidoc salt because it was, you know, it's like the water salt. And one of the things that may happen, actually does happen with pedocs, is that as they get crowded into a piece of wood, they get stunted, which means they stop growing. But they, they, they stop growing, but they become uh, sexually mature at a very small size, so they can still reproduce at a very small size. So that's what you see there. Uh, and that's a picture of the shell. It can grow, it can be much bigger than the ones in the little log. Uh, it can grow to be about an inch long. And you see the structure here on the front part of the shell, the anterior end of the shell. You know, it's 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 those ridges with teeth. It's really hard calcium carbonate. And they rock back and forth to be able to pour into wood. That's a cross section of the little log. And you can see that they, they all only they keep always keep a distance, same distance to the, to the surface of the, the wood. So they can put their siphons off and suck the water in. And they, they have special structures. This is a special structure I'm going to show you now. The common uh, is present in most members of the family of Poladine and Polads. It's called an apophysis. An apophysis is the, uh, the, uh, the, the foot muscles hold on to that, and, and the foot muscles contract and relax. You know, left one, right one. They alternate. And when they do that, that's what causes them move, you know, for the boring movement that, that, you know, that they do the boring to the wood. A less, less known species, uh, it's called Juanantia killingi. I forgot the name, I think it's called Arstip. No, not Arstip either. I forgot the common name of that. Um, and this one is for, from um, a piece of wood found in Port St. Joe on the, in the Panhandle of Florida. So here we are again, two, uh, these two uh, blocks of um, the mud dog. From um, Sunnyvale Island, and the last one I want to show you is actually uh, the one that I, I showed at, at, in the opening. My my opening slide was about this species, and we're dealing with that. And it's very curious because it was found by, uh, as I said, by colleagues from FWC in Melbourne, uh, Brevard County on the east coast. And the shell you see there is a conical scale, very well known. I mean, we all know. And love calico scallops. And those those shells of calico scallops, I mean, I think they brought about 30 plus uh, to the museum. And I started counting and looking at them and, and doing some initial research. We we started using the name uh Ostepino, Um, because that's what you know, that's what is out there. It may not be their species, and you understand why. Uh, so we started, I gave, a, for those of you who weren't Florida animalologists, um, last April in St. Pete, you may remember I gave a, one, one presentation about that species and Stephen, Stephen, Stephen Geiger gave another one. Um, so I worked with them and I'm still working with them. And this is a type of, of uh, one of the, one of the, you know, Arms of this species deposited at uh, the Academy of Natural Sciences. Um, and, and this is more or less about eight, eight millimeters long. Uh, and the shell has a, what we call a column, which is a growth of the shell that happens after the shell gets to a given size. And if, if the shell is open, you know, the, the, the valves don't, don't shut completely. And then at some point they build this column. Um, here uh, is a uh, the way that we, we we saw it when it first came in. So you see the inside of the calico scallop 
and there were those dark blisters, you know, the hard blisters, dark. So if you ever find anything like that here, please let me know because it's it's very interesting. I'm interested in pursuing that as a research avenue. So if you if you kill that little dark blister with a pair of forceps or a, a little screwdriver, you you see the little bike bulb inside. See, it looks almost like a little, little trunken anatomy. So this is the anterior part of the shell here. So, yeah. So, it's like boring, like you know, It's very hard work for these fragile animals. What do you think is the real purpose? Like in the woods, are they looking for something really to eat? Well, that's a very good question. I should have, I should have opened by, by you know, say some, some, let's say some. You want me to be here? Yes, I can. I, uh, yeah, should, I, should, I should have opened by saying that space in nature, you know, be it the rainforest, be it coral reefs, be it, you know, the sand off, off, offshore in Sunnabel, space in nature is at a premium. So if, if, there are, if there are spaces, if there are places that animals can go, eventually through the course of their evolution, they'll go there. Um, and, 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 and those structures like wood and, and, and rural colonies, you know, they, they were there for the taking. So, they, they, you know, some of, those, some of those families, like the, the muscle family, the Venus clam family, they have representatives that eventually started digging, barring into wood or barring into, um, you know, rural colonies and all that. If the purpose re purpose meaning really it's it's a it's a more long you have to take a broader view you know into the geological you know history the past the long what you would call the deep past and, and and that's 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 what happens they have protection some of them eat wood you know they feed on wood some of them have bacteria in their gut that helps digest food that's the case of the sheep worms and some of them are just in the wood protection and for space you know it's like you know you know you're in a very complicated city whether you're gonna where you're gonna leave you will take whatever comes your way you mean um i don't know if i answer your question but and and the protection is key i mean once it wants one of those pit oxygen inside a piece of wood i mean you're gonna die of old age or some infection or something but nobody's gonna feed on them so let me go back to the uh, this little white tuberculosis. You know, this is actually a shell, actually the whole animal that was sent to me by uh, John Slapisinski from the Florida Museum. That we want to make comparisons. And, uh, and this is a shell kind of bivalve that, that measures about millimeters in length, about 0 0.4 inch. It's not big, but it's not small. Our specimens are much, much smaller. And still we're considering to be the same species. We can be, we may be wrong. Uh, so did you see what I just did? Let me go back, I don't do that. I just put one of our shells, I super, superimposed one of our shells on top of the bottom shell there. Look carefully here when I do that. Whoops. There's something wrong here. Okay, now, you see there, I put one of our shells. This is an average shell that we found, and we consider it to be the same species. No. Big, big leap of faith, but we are, we have people now, as we speak, colleagues at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard doing the DNA sequencing to see if you know they match what we know of the Arthropod dog with the ones we have. They were dry for about a year and a half, and they are very small. They're about you know the largest one is about three and a half millimeters, which is very tiny. It's it's about zero point zero point fifteen of an inch. But uh, the colleagues there, the students and, and and my colleague uh, who runs the molecology lab, I mean, the very great lab, 
you could extract DNA even from the dry animals, which made me very happy. Anyway, there it is. And I have uh, those super cool, uh, you know, I really like that. There was uh, done by this, you know, another colleague of mine at the Sandia Laboratories in New Mexico. And he works at this big uh, defense agency. And, uh, and he wanted to do CT scans of Shell. And everyone is doing CT scans now. We came like, oh, please. But he is a really great, uh, you know, he's an engineer, John Corbett. And he said, oh, and then I, I said, can, John, can you, can you do this CT scan so we can see the little oyster pedox inside the calico scallops? And he did that, but he put color in it so we can visualize them. So each one is painted you know, artificially a different color. And on the left, on the right here, you have a boring sponge. And that boring sponge, you could not see it. You cannot see it. There's a tiny pinhole that's the only, everything else is inside. Um, so that shows you a little osteopedox inside the, inside the clam, I mean the skeleton. Well, using CT scans. And another view. And next, I have a, 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 a CT scan that shows the more or less the relationship between the thickness of the calic calicus color. Uh, I'm going to blow up the, this rectangle here. And then I'm going to put some uh, a light yellow line here. And that's the thickness of the of the shell of that scallop. You, you, and you see that the, the bar in Washington Pidox are more or less the same size as the thickness of the calico host shell. And I assume that if they were barring into a much thicker shell, like an oyster or a marshmallow, they would be much bigger. But they grow only so far because they, their host shell is so narrow. The calico scallops that I measured, I measured about 30, very near where the, the boring bivalves were. And the average thickness is about 1.2 milli, 1, 1 millimeters. And they're very, scallop, uh, calico scallops are very thin. And they are reinforced because they have that beautiful, uh, you know, what do you call that? Uh, chamfer, uh, that shape, you know, the ridges and valleys there. Um, a couple more pictures. Those are CT scans. You can see the little holes outside where the boring uh, animal first started. And then the same view with, with, the, with the colored, colored one. So this one will be this one here. And I think next I have one that I really like to, I hope you like to, but it's a uh, it's an animation that begins with the opaque shell. It shows you the holes and shows you the little blisters, the little dwellings inside the shell that uh, the bivalve, the host bivalve makes those dark blisters. So it moves to show you, and you can see the little blisters there, and then it goes into transparent mode. So you can see the sponge here also. Oh, that's that. I think uh, that's my little message to you. I don't know if you have questions or I hope they're on the mm -hmm. Can you say something? Yes, for those of you who are on Zoom, if you have questions, you can write them in the chat box and Barb Miller will, will share them with us in a minute. Um, we'll take questions first from people in the room. For those, so those on Zoom can hear, we're going to pass around a microphone so that you can uh, ask your question. So if you have a question for Dr. Leal, go ahead and raise your hand now and we'll we'll pass that microphone around. Yes, Angie. Hi. Um, Angie, hang on. Wait, 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 wait till you get the light. Oh, 
the switch to this mic. A little more complicated when you have a live audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if it's a nice question, but um, you know, the angel way. The only time I've seen it, you know, punched for or was up in the seat of the seat. And I don't want to be put in a tough state there with legs of the knees. They were followers and not uh, balls. And so the tough state didn't sit in that pose. Yeah, that's the, I kept saying, um, I, th I think I said it two or three times that they are in straddling this. Uh, they, they, can, they can't find them in places where the body's going back to like here, they are. Uh, or you can find them in places where the mud is softer. But one thing is just is true. Uh, the whole of an angel reading never collapses on the veil. Um, you know, we don't have, they don't have the, it's not like they, they have lost us utterly soft sand or, you know, once they make that hole, that's always there, right? Everything. I got this right here. So that is such a coincidence. Just yesterday, I saw exactly what he was talking to. Turner Beach. I, I'm a nutty snorkel, and he wanted to go. It's only like two, two feet of water by a mansion in Turner Beach, like a big giant home. There were so many in the mud, angel rings, and I was going, what in the world are they doing? They're straight up in the air. And and, and they're, not, they're not alive. And it took me quite a while to fly on the other screen in the mud. But I just think it's wild that today he's talking about it, and I just saw it yesterday. Well, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Any more? Can I ask them? Can I ask them to Zoom? Oh, it's far. Zoom. Yeah. Barb, go ahead. Well, well it, first of all, there's something blocking our, our view there. I don't know what that is. It looks like some round, dark thing. I'm not sure. Um, but also, if whoever was in the room asking the question, if there's any way we could either get them on mic or repeat the question. That'd be really amazing for those of us online. Okay, we yeah. Um, sorry, sorry about that. We we had a microphone, but apparently somehow it wasn't picking up. So yeah, no worries. We'll work on that. But yeah. um and Connor's here to fix everything. So so no fear, Connor's <laughs> here. So, <laughs> Awesome. That's exciting. Thank you for that. And whenever you're ready, we'll ask questions. Uh, yep. Okay. Go ahead, Barb. Great. Well, we had an early question. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you, Dr. Leal. There's lots of people here that are saying cool, fascinating, you know, very interesting. Um, so the feedback is overwhelmingly positive, and we thank you for that. Um, so we had a question early on about the lifespan of this shipworm and somebody suggested it was two to three years old, would be two to three years. Just wondering if you have any other age range for some of those other worm type shells. You're asking me for the question. The question is how, how 
What's the lifespan of the shipworm? The, the lifespan of the shipworms and other similar. You keep repeating that. Asking about the lifespan. Yeah, I don't know the lifespan. I always, I would be only knew that. I don't want to show a number, you know, just too much good. Um, yeah. I'm not that. Okay, great. So someone asked, are the coquinas that we see on the water's edge a burrowing bivalve? Karen asked that. The coquinas are burrowing bivalves. They're not watering bivalves. Because they live in that area of, uh, you know, the, the wave, uh, where the waves gently fell, in some cases not so gently. But uh, they go into the sand and they come out, but they are not watering. They just, whatever they do is just using their little foot you know, as a, like a little uh, digging tool to get into the sand. Okay, great, thank you. Let me see if we have some other ones here. Was that it, Barb? And yeah, that looks like it. If anybody else is on Zoom and I missed something, please let me know. Otherwise, I think that's it. All right, well, I'd like to give a big round of applause to Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was fascinating. Yeah. We always enjoy having you come share with us. And, and not every club gets to have somebody with a PhD in malacology come speak for those. Oh, so we feel really fortunate. Um, let's see. Kathy, Kim Lee, the people on Zoom, is Kathy around? 